a mile, a regular mile, is just a stinky, arbitrary unit of length created by the Romans. Mile just means 1,000, mille passus, literally 1,000 paces, and every 1,000 paces the Romans would slap down a milestone, indicating how many miles from Rome you were at that point. There's a difference between miles and nautical miles because they're both trying to solve completely different problems. A nautical mile was invented to help solve what used to be a crazy difficult problem. How can sailors navigate on the open ocean when they can't see anything on the horizon? Now you could use a GPS tracker or a map, but somebody had to be the first person to make the map. And how could you make a map when you can't just put down a milestone and count how many miles it's been? You can't see anything on the horizon. At first to solve this problem, ancient sailors didn't solve this problem. They just stayed close to coastlines where they could see land and know where they were going. If they needed to head out into the wide open water, they would probably be doing it on like an inland sea, like the Mediterranean, and it might only be a couple of days before they reach landfall. Oh, oh my goodness, look at that, it's, it's the Phoenician trade routes. They would literally coastal hop between landmarks, and then when they were due south of something that they wanted to get to, they just follow the North Star upwards until they reached it. Even on this path to Sardinia, they would just follow the North Star north to Sardinia, like that. But this started to change around the year, well, like the late 1400s. Actually, more specifically, the Portuguese are discovering something interesting. In 1434, the Portuguese mariner Gilles Eanish is the first to sail around the dreaded Cape Bojador on the coast of the Western Sahara. They conquered Algarve, and then they went south to Morocco and conquered this little town called Ceuta, and then they went south along the Moroccan coast, and then they were like, whoa, it just keeps going. We can just keep following this. They kept going around Africa, and like years, like, like 20 years before Columbus ever set sail, they were like sailing around the Gulf of Guinea. They kept going all the way to South Africa, literally before Columbus. Staying close to the African coastline is really inefficient in a sail ship because of the way the currents and the, the winds in the Atlantic work. So it's way more efficient to swing out towards Brazil and then round South Africa in the middle of the open ocean. Einfall der Mongolen hat den Europäern die Seiten The invasion of the Mongols opened the Silk Road to Europeans. The collapse of the Mongol Empire closed it to them again. But by then, Europeans had acquired an appetite for goods and merchandise of the Orient. So they looked for new routes to the Far East. People in Europe at the time wanted this luxurious, delectable, sexy thing called spices. At the time, they got it by paying a fat sum to the Ottoman Empire or the Venetians because they controlled the trade of the spices coming from India into Europe. European peasants are eating this really bland food. They didn't even have pepper. Yeah, it's fashionable for kings to eat spicy shit, and the Ottomans are making like huge profits, basically profiteering off of the spice trade, because it's a, it's a monopoly at this point. Meanwhile, the Portuguese looked at the best atlas that they had at the time, and thought that there's this blank spot on the bottom. If they could find a way around Africa, then they could get to India and bypass the Ottomans and their money-shaving grift. But back to the winds and currents in the Atlantic, it was it was challenging. Yeah, you needed some sort of like tool or a map to go out into the middle of the open ocean. The Portuguese invented this thing called the Mariner's Astrolabe. You could use it to calculate your latitude, how far north or south on the globe you are, because you, you basically find a fixed point, like the sun or a star that you know. At a certain time of year, the sun is gonna be at a predictable angle at the equator and a predictable angle north of the equator. So you can tell how far north or south you are. Yeah. Yeah, because like at noon, the sun is at its highest point in the sky, and you can measure how high it is above the horizon, and the higher the sun, the closer you are to the equator. So with the astrolabe, you can now make better maps, but they're still kind of medieval looking. Navigating the open ocean still requires a lot of guesswork. What if you could make latitude super accurate? Like, what if you literally knew the exact circumference of the entire planet, so that you could calculate distances perfectly. If you look at a modern Mercator projection, if you draw a straight line between two points, you can follow those coordinates in a ship and you'll get to where you wanna go. Despite the 2D map 
showing a 3D world. That's why Mercator looks the way it does, because the poles obviously shrink in on the sphere. Like, some people sometimes point out that Mercator is like an imperialist project to like make Africa look smaller than it is and make Sweden look bigger than it is. But yeah, that's just, that's just an unfortunate side effect. So basically the problem that Renaissance navigators are facing is that they're trying to depict this massive spherical planet onto a two-dimensional map when they have no idea how to calculate the circumference of the Earth and no exact distances. Like, your straight line on a modern map actually looks like this on a curved Earth. Mm -hmm. In comes a Dutch man with a fantastic name who decides to take on the gargantuan task of measuring the Earth. Willebrod Snellius rediscovered that it actually wouldn't be that difficult. The reason I say rediscovered is because there was this ancient Greek polymath called Eratosthenes who actually calculated and discovered the circumference of the Earth 200 years before Jesus lived. But it was more or less lost to time, and I guess it wasn't terribly useful for ancient people yet because they weren't sailing into the open ocean very often. By the way, there's a misconception that we think medieval people didn't know the Earth was a sphere. They did. They knew it was a sphere. It wasn't. They, they didn't think it was a flat Earth. Yes, okay, so... So they were calling Columbus stupid, not because he thought the Earth was round, but because he thought the Earth was, like, skinny and egg-like, and India was right there, and there was no such thing as the Americas. Columbus thought the Earth was an egg. Yeah, and, um. and, and he had, like, he kind of just had a hunch that there would be land out there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's the craziest thing. Okay, so, I digress. Ol Snellius climbs up to the top of a church steeple in the Netherlands and measures the angles between him at the top of the steeple and other known objects in the distance. The Netherlands is flat, I'm not sure if you've heard. So if you get up like 50 meters, you can see the church steeples of other towns pretty clearly. So he calculated the angles between them, as well as the angle of the sun at various times of the year. And his final result ended up being only about 1% smaller than the actual circumference of the Earth. Wow. Yeah, he nailed it. You too can make this calculation today if you want. <laughs> Climb to the top of a tall building. <laughs> Climb to the top of a tall building and look out. And <laughs> let us know in the comments section. <laughs> let, let us know in the comments section. <laughs> Climb to the top of a tall building and calculate the circumference of the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, now that you more or less know the circumference of the Earth, combine that with the increasingly accurate maps that you've got, and you can create a geo-positioning system. Let's explain how. In 1620, the Englishman Edmund Gunter thought that the best navigation system would be one directly linked to that circumference and to latitude. If you remember from math class, a circle has 360 degrees. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so Gunter roughly took Snellius's measurement, divided it by 360, and calculated that one degree of Earth's distance, Earth's circumference, is about 352,000 feet, which is 66 and two-thirds miles. If you divide that number by 60 to make it more digestible, then you get Gunter's nautical mile. The nautical mile was a piece of the circumference of the Earth, and it was very close to a regular mile. So with that calculation that Gunter made, you can now be anywhere on Earth, measure the angle of the sun or the stars to determine your latitude, and then make a way more accurate map because you can actually know your distance from things. Snellius's calculation of Earth's circumference wasn't actually quite accurate, so neither was Gunter's nautical mile, though. But it, it, it didn't matter. The methodology of 1 60th of one degree of Earth's circumference is what a nautical mile is. But that's not the end of it. So France and the metric system would have the last laugh. But I sort of fibbed earlier. Uh, the Earth isn't technically a sphere, it's kind of like an obloid... What is that word? I don't... Uh, oblate spheroid. It's an oblate spheroid. So it's a bit flatter at the poles, and a bit more bulging at the equator. Like me. Because the Earth is not a sphere, 1 60th of a degree of latitude is not the same distance everywhere on Earth. So different countries ended up having ever so slightly different lengths for a nautical mile, depending on their calculations. France liked to standardize measurements and said this is stupid, and so they defined it as 1,852 meters, 
which was based on their definition of the meter as one ten millionth of a quarter meridian, basically a quarter chunk of Earth's circumference. Wow. All the metric countries got together in 1929 in Monaco and agreed on this length as the international standard for a nautical mile. Uh, it took a lot longer for the US and Britain to get the memo, as always. It was 1954 for the US and 1970 until the British adopted the International Nautical Mile. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and there it is. Ships and also airplanes are now able to navigate around the spherical globe, the more or less spherical globe, using flat maps and coordinates on those flat maps that are super accurate based on a mathematical ratio established by the nautical mile. Wow, what an interesting fact <laughs> you have just delivered straight from your mouth to my brain. <laughs>